Here we are looking at the concept of the geologic column. Here we have the concept of evolution. Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago according to the evolutionary theory. Two and a half billion years ago, Proterozoic and Archaean, nothing but uh, bacteria were formed. And then the Cambrian, an explosion, and all the way up to the top where we see a Chevrolet. <laughs> But the geologic column didn't produce that. So that is essentially the Bible at the, of evolutionary theory. Paleozoic, that's the damn distant past. Mesozoic, that's the central area of the dinosaurs. And Cenozoic, the era of the mammals leading up to man. But here we have, on the left, some investigators who are looking into the geologic column looking over the side, and there's a living, flying pterodactyl. Is that realistic? Well, you probably know, some of you know, that I led three scientific expeditions into the jungles of Papua New Guinea in search of living pterodactyls because they had eyewitness accounts of living pterodactyls. And they were not flying fox bats. They do have flying fox bats. Do you have those in Peru, flying fox bats? Uh, and, and they have a big uh, wingspan, and they're furry, and uh, they're bats, but they have a head that looks like a fox. But these pterodactyls are not those. Some of these have up to a 20-foot wingspan. We made five sightings while we were there. We couldn't get close to them. We did find their footprints afterwards, so there is a creature that is not uh, not a fox bat, he's a flying reptile, and all indications are he meets the criteria for uh, the pterodactyl, which was essentially a flying reptile lived at the same time with the dinosaurs, or flying dinosaur. So what is the real answer to the geologic column? Well, let's study this a little bit. This subject is vitally important because the geologic column is the key illustration of the evolution model. If you will take time after the lecture today to read that panel of statements at the back, just to the left as you exit, if you will read that panel, you will find that the world's leading evolutionary scholars, such as Richard Dawkins, Stephen Jay Gould, etc., the world's leading evolution proponents have stated clearly that if it could be proved that these footprints at Glen Rose, human footprints, were genuine, according to their words, that would blow evolution out of the waters. And then one of them stated in the technical literature that if, if, we could, if this column, if, if any topsy-turvy fossils were found to upset this geologic column, evolution would be devastated because it is a systematic concept of development of early, early simple life forms to progressive development of more complicated life forms. We've got a problem right there, a major problem. Because two years ago, in France and Japan, two separate laboratories were examining a little bacterium. Does anyone know the technical reference to that bacterium? MO-1. Now, previously, they had found in that layer, in the lowest layer, the very bottom, previously, they had found bacteria that were supposedly living there 600 million years ago. But these bacteria had flagella, that is, an appendage a propeller that was driven by an electric motor, but it wasn't driven by electrons, it was driven by protons. Did you know that? Driven by protons, more sophisticated than any design engine we have today. It has a rotor, a stator, a universal joint, all of the factors and components we have. And they had, they had found these in that layer. So. Whoops, that's incredibly complex. It could not have evolved. No way. 
No way to get inorganic, non-living compounds to evolve into living compounds. Anyway, they've spent billions of dollars attempting to do so and have not been successful. But then what blew their minds, and then they published it in the technical literature, was MO-1 bacterium. It not only had one of these propellers, flagellum, not only one with one electric motor, it had seven clumped together with 24 gears meshing them so that as they turned, they would all be synchronized. Now you tell me how that could have evolved. So at the very bottom of the geologic column is an insurmountable problem for the very idea of evolution and for this concept. So this subject is vitally important because this geologic column is the key illustration of the evolution model. If its basic concept is true, if its basic concept is true, what is its basic concept? That you have simple life forms that have graduated to more complicated life forms and ultimately to man. If its basic concept is true, long ages have transpired and life forms have indeed developed through progressive stages over vast periods of time. And so evolution is demonstrated to be true if its basic concepts are true. Since the days of Charles Lyell and subsequent to Charles Darwin, the imaginary geologic column, because it's not found anywhere intact anywhere in the world. And by the way, some of these forms that are layers that are supposed to be primitive are found on the tops with the other layers beneath them. This imaginary geologic column has been used to illustrate evolution. So let's see if it's true. But this column is not found intact in the geologic strata anywhere on Earth and is often contradicted in sequence by actual field studies. And you have this information there on your lesson sheet. There is, however, a general tendency for these rocks and their encased fossils to be found in roughly this order for definite reasons, because you have that which already is dwelling in the bottom of the sea at the bottom of the column, where it should be. You have that which is then comfortable to go in and out like amphibians next. And then you have those that really don't like that much water coming all at one time, and they reflect and get a little higher temporarily. Uh, so there's a reason for the, roughly this form. And you have an abbreviated form of this column found at the Grand Canyon, and the nearby Grand Staircase formation of the Colorado Plateau in southwestern United States. So here is this column. The Big Bang, debris from that Big Bang, coalesced, formed in the Milky Way galaxy, formed our solar system, and ultimately, over long periods of time, about 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth was formed, and crust began to form, and living systems not too long after that, two and a half billion years ago, began to evolve. And as they evolved progressively, this is what we have, uh, the early forms, crustaceans, and then the dinosaurs, and then the mammal, and ultimately, man. All of these wonderful systems that evolved will collapse as the universe collapses back upon itself in the big crunch. It began as a big bang, according to evolutionary theory. It will end in a fire explosion called the big crunch. Or if there's not enough mass to cause it to collapse upon itself, these galaxies will extend out and out and out farther apart, and it will end in the big freeze, ultimately without any information and heat being shared by the systems. Or if it's pretty well balanced and it's not going to collapse or it's not going to extend out and out, it'll end in the big fizzle. That is the technical word, technical terminology for how it's all going to end. But the concept is, no matter how you look at it, if evolution is true, there's no hope anywhere. Ultimately, nobody has any hope. And the basis of evolutionary theory is hopelessness.